Welcome to the Carpinteria Shark Colloquium. Appreciate the good turnout tonight. Thank you, for all, thank you all for coming. I'm Dave Durflinger, the Carpinteria City Manager, and I'll be moderating the meeting this evening. We're very fortunate to have a panel of experts uh, with us tonight. Uh, Jeff Harris is here from the National Marine Mammal Laboratory, a division of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Administ uh, Atmospheric Administration. Bill Struble is here of the National Marine Fisheries Service, also a division of NOAA. Ralph Collier is here of the Shark Research Committee, and Peter Howorth is here of Santa Barbara Marine Mammal Center. So let's give our hand to the panel that agreed to come this evening. The purpose of our meeting this evening is to learn from experts about facts and research on sharks and recent shark activity in our region and to have an opportunity to ask questions of these experts and have a dialogue. Uh, our agenda for the evening is simple. We're going to have the uh, expert panelists come up and speak to you, make their presentations. We'll have time at the end for question and answers uh, and um, about a half hour. If you have questions, uh, we've handed out paper. Please uh, uh, write your questions down and we'll uh, filter through them and pick a sampling of questions uh, for our panel. Uh, a few housekeeping matters. Um, portions of this meeting are being recorded. We will rebroadcast uh, um, the presentations and some interviews and the Q&A period uh, later on on Government Access Channel 21, the Carpinteria Channel. Um, some folks have requested copies of the meeting. It, uh, we'll, we'll give us a call at City Hall and we'll talk about the possibility of making uh, CD copies of that. Um, if you need a pencil, um, just raise your hand. Matt Roberts will be in the back uh, to write down your question. Um, restrooms, as you probably saw, are in the lobby. Um, please take note of emergency exits on either side of me here and at the back of the building. Um, this event is being sponsored by the City of Carpinteria. Uh, so uh, and we have some council members here this evening. Council member Al Clark is here. Uh, Mayor Brad Stein is here. Yeah, give him a big hand. Those are my bosses and my contract's up for renewal, so I appreciate that. <laughs> thanks, thanks for your help. Also, I want to give a big thank you to Matt Roberts, our Parks and Rec Director, who uh, organized this whole event. Thank you, Matt. Um, also sponsors of uh, this evening are the National Marine Fisheries Service of NOAA, which allowed a couple of our speakers to be here, of course. Um, Santa Barbara Marine Mammal uh, Center, a uh, great volunteer, 25 years. Earl Richmond set up all the uh, stuff here tonight, so thank you, Earl. And of course, the Shark Research Institute is also sponsored this evening. I uh, also want to send out special thanks to the uh, Plaza Playhouse Theater for hosting our event tonight. Thank you, Plaza Playhouse Theater. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll all return for other great movies and musical events and plays that they have here at the theater. It's a great local treasure for us. Um, OK, to get started. Um, we're going to talk about sharks tonight, but we're also going to talk about seals and other pinnipeds. Our first speaker, Bill Struble, is a criminal investigator with NOAA, National Marine F uh, Fisheries Service, assigned to the Carpinteria area, but much more than that. He's in charge of all the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Um, NMFS promotes the stewardship of living marine resources for the benefit of the nation through science-based conservation and management and promotion of the health of their environment. So uh, as Bill comes up, uh, I want to also have Peter Holworth come up. I'll introduce Peter properly later on, but I know Peter wanted to make a few opening remarks with regard to uh, Mr. Struble. So some of you are probably wondering why Bill Struble is here, because he's involved with law and marine mammals. One of the subjects that came up is, let's get rid of the seals at Carpinteria. And that's a pretty complicated thing to do, and probably a really bad idea. Somebody suggested relocating them. Uh, traditionally, 
We tried relocating, not we, Fish and Wildlife Service, not connected with NOAA, tried relocating sea otters at San Nicolas Island, and most of them swam back uh, in a matter of days or weeks. There have also been various translocation efforts of sea lions interfering with salmon and steelhead runs, and they've been translocated to various places. It doesn't work, and moreover, it won't fix a problem at all. Nonetheless, some of the people here in the audience may be interested in getting rid of the seals, and Bill Struble is here at my invitation to talk about laws and marine mammals, so it is pertinent. So, Bill, come on up. Good evening, I'm Bill Struble with NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement, and I know you guys, I'm not going to talk about sharks, and you guys are here to hear the researchers. It's just a little bit of background information to help everybody have a better understanding of the bigger picture on the coastal interactions. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, particularly the elements of it that um, pertain along the coast here in Carpinteria. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, celebrated its 40th anniversary this last year. It was enacted by Congress in 1972 to protect the marine mammal species and population stocks. Um, at that point in time, nowhere else in the world had a government made a conservation of a healthy and stable eco ecosystem um, to conserve individual species as the Marine Mammal Protection Act did. So who enforces the Marine Mammal Protection Act? It's actually split up between several agencies. So NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement enforces it as it pertains to whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, and sea lions in the wild. Um, here off the coast, we also have sea otters. The, the Marine Mammal Protection Act also um, protects them, but that's enforced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then when you um, deal with marine mammals that are within aquariums and similar type situation on public display in a captive type capacity, that's actually the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture. So what type of things happen that, um, that I get concerned about? Shooting of seals and sea lions and dolphins, whale strikes, chasing whales and dolphins um, by vessels or people on the beach, and individuals coming too close to haul out sites and disturbing the animals there. Um, some way some of the take is prevented um, in some of the commercial fishing industry. In the drift gill net fishery, we require pingers on certain types of drift gill nets to keep dolphins and whales out. There's uh, the regulations and deterrent devices for other fisheries to help reduce entanglements or, or interactions that people aren't looking for. So the main aspect of the Marine Mammal Protection Act as it applies along here is that it prohibits take of marine mammals anywhere in U.S. waters. So what is take? Take is defined by the act um, to hunt, harass, capture, or kill any marine mammal or attempt to do so. And the key here, um, as it applies along the coast often, is the harass element. So harass is further defined as any act of pursuit, torment, or annoyance which has the potential to injure or disturb a marine mammal stock in the wild by causing disruption of behavior patterns, including but not limited to the migration, breathing, nursing, feeding, or sheltering of marine mammals. So in, this, in the back photo here, we have the rookery site up by San Simeon where the elephant seals haul out. You can see how this definition definitely applies to um, our coastal marine rookeries. So, and talking about San Simeon, um, we have a group of volunteers up there that interpret um, and talk to the public when they come to look at the animals giving birth and hauling out on the beaches. We also have a similar group right here in Carpinteria, the Carpinteria Seal Watch. It's a large number of people. They do a great job and they prevent a lot of headaches for me, quite frankly, by um, letting people know what's going on there and quite frankly, preventing a lot of violations. So thanks to all the members of that group that are out there. Um, Typical problems I have along the coast here, um, on the Carpinteria coast, is people flushing the animals off the beach, dogs running loose into the rookery, and more often than not, it seems like for some reason, this primal instinct seems to come in and we end up with a dead animal at the, at the dogs being off leash and coming in. And it's not, a, it's not a pretty sight. Usually the owners are pretty upset that it happened also, but it still ends up being a violation. Um, Marine Mammal Protection Act does have 
civil and criminal um, penalties. The civil penalties can be up to $11,000 per violation, and criminal, criminal penalties, it's a class A misdemeanor. So um, in the federal system, you know, other, that's a fine up to $100,000 or one year in jail, obviously, that's a maximum fine. But uh, just to know that there are repercussions from violating the act, and uh, I think that's about it, because you guys really want to hear the experts talk about the other stuff. I just wanted to lay the background on the, on the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Jeff Harris. He is a research e ecologist with the National Marine Mammal Laboratory of NOAA. He has a bachelor's degree of science in marine biology from Western Washington University. Uh, and he's a researcher for NOAA. Um, he is currently studying the population, demographics, behavior, and ecological function of marine mammal species such as harbor seals, elephant seals, sea lions, uh, and others at the Santa Barbara Channel Islands and along the entire California coast. So please give a warm welcome to Jeff Harris. Okay, yeah, I'm here to, uh, to tell you what's going on on uh, the Channel Islands. Um, I work out there uh, mainly on um, sea lions and fur seals, but um, we've had some pretty interesting stuff going on as, as far as uh, shark predation is concerned out there. Okay, so there's a, a female who has obviously encountered a shark. Um, we've had a, um, a, a long-standing program out there um, on, on San Miguel Island in particular. Um, some of us in this room have been out there for a real long time, but um, I've only been out there for, fi for five years, so I'm just getting, just getting started out there. But, but anyways, um, from 1972 to to uh, 2010, um, there's been very little evidence of, of uh, interaction with California sea lions and, and sharks. Um, and that, uh, that changed in 2011 when um, we started seeing a lot, of, a lot of animals coming to the beach with lesions. <clears throat> and um, so, so the vast majority of these attacks are, or um, lesions are occurring from June to August, although that's when our field season is, so um, the, that's our, our primary um, observation period. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising if it if it continued through into the winter, um, and uh, we're just not there to see it. So here's a breakdown of, of what we've been seeing. Um, so uh, as you can see, 2011 there were 134 individual animals with lesions. Um, and in 2012, we saw a big increase um, uh, to 373, or 373 uh, animals with shark lesions. Though um, the, the real number here is, is actually more like, uh, well, you want to look at uh, fresh lesions, you know, because in 2012, we could be seeing animals that, you know, had been, had scarring from the year before. Um, so, so in 2011, there were, there were 80 fresh lesions. Um, I consider that, you know, something that's healing or, or actually, you know, healing or, or bleeding. Um, they're pretty obviously fresh. So, um, so and then the, the number in 2012 would be about 200. Um, so, so still a, a large increase. Um, and, and our effort is about, is about the same uh, throughout the year. And basically when we're there, we, we look at a lot of animals, pretty much most of them. So... Um, we get a pretty good idea about what's going on out there. And uh, so here's a breakdown with um, the uh, age classes are being affected. Um, adult females, um, 341 of them have been adult females, which is, uh, you know, which is significant as far as, um, you know, reproduction and, and everything else. So it's pretty interesting to see that age class being taken. That's, that's a, new, uh, a new development. Um, also, the juvenile age class, which, which hang out on the island, um, we're seeing quite a few of those. And, and you know, to the, those are only, I put eight weights on here so you get an idea, but they're, you know, 60 to 200 pounds there um, can easily be taken by, by a, a large shark or even a, a medium-sized shark. So uh, there's, females are central place foragers, so they're going to be they're going to be coming back to the island to, to feed their pup um, 
they're they're spending a lot of time in the water. Um, they're they're home for about two days. They offload their their um, energy to to their pup, then take off again for another five. So they're in the water a lot, um, and uh, I think that's why they're they're interacting with sharks more than more than the other age classes. And yeah, so we're th thinking that uh, their range is from, you know, San Luis Obispo County to down to the Mexican border. Really, um, there's there's um, an ample supply of of uh, California sea lions in that in that uh, region. Uh, most of most of the females that we tag are actually um, are heading north from San Miguel. So so that could be we don't know for for uh, for certain where this is happening, but but it could be probably occurring north, <clears throat> north of the island. So uh, we do uh, regular mortality surveys uh, at San Miguel, um, and we have only only recovered one animal that it, uh, that uh, seemed to be seemed to be um, killed by by a shark wound. Um, surprisingly, you know, you'd think that uh, they'd be happening right on shore, uh, which is um, common common at some of the other more famous uh, places like the Farallons or in, or in South Africa, where you can actually observe uh, predation events from shore. But uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, uh, although I'm, I'm constantly looking. Uh, I haven't been able to see one yet, so. So yeah, um, there's no shortage of prey out there. Um, just with Calif California sea lions alone, this year we had a, a banner year. Um, 32,000 pups, and uh, and they seem to be doing doing just fine out there. So that there's plenty of food for for a large shark. Um, and so some of the stuff we've been doing, uh, I've been photographing um, every every animal with a lesion I see, and that's pretty much the only ones that I that I count. I miss. It's frustrating when I miss them, but uh, it's nice to have the reference and to be able to actually make sure you know what you saw. So. You need some kind of some kind of record, but also, um, if possible, if the animals allow it, um, it's more difficult than you th more difficult than you think. But you can see in the center of that that bite there, there's uh, two green dots, and those are those are um, three inches and in, three inches apart. Now they're parallel fixed lasers, um, and uh, to kind of give you an idea of of what the size of the bite is like. So that, uh, well, Ralph can tell you later about. Uh, maybe the size of that shark, but um, but uh, it's about you know 18 to 21 inches probably, um, just to the part we can see, um, which will I think explain a little bit more about what's significant with that and what's not. <clears throat> so the impacts on, on California sea lions in particular. Um, yeah, down the road they could maybe affect the population, but uh, it's a really healthy, healthy group of animals out there, um, with over a hundred thousand individuals, um, and that's adults. Um, so, so really, there's there's a potential for for predation uh, to be a significant factor of mortality, but uh, that's nothing to be worried about at all um, in the short term. So, so and also because sharks are are a uh, you know a large slow growing species and they need to be a certain size to be able to take a marine mammal um, so we're just starting to see it, it, it appears that we're just starting to see um, sharks large enough to uh, that are returning to the systems to take marine mammals and also um, and, th and that's you know from from bite sizes and everything else uh, it appears that these are that these are actually pretty small sharks um, so it'll be interesting going forward to see um, once they get larger, maybe they they will be more efficient at uh, at handling their prey. So um, I, I and I think it's a you know a good thing that um, these these fish are coming back because uh, there's obviously a lot of a lot of prey out there, and um, you know sea lions should have a predator, uh, and uh, up till now they seem to have been um, ecologically. Uh, uh, ecologically removed, um, at least as far as California sea lions on San Miguel go. So it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting thing that uh, you know these animals are coming back. 
<clears throat> and uh, yeah, what will happen with predation trends? Well, I think they're gonna, um, they're gonna persist. Um, I mean, as long as the food's there. And uh, San Miguel is a really unique place. I mean, there, there are animals there year round, um, plenty of prey uh, at any time of the year. And um, it's gonna be really exciting to, uh, to document it and, and um, see what happens. So we have a really good, a pretty good handle on the on the sea lion population. So if there's a significant factor of mortality, um, we should be able to, uh, you know, have a pretty good understanding of, of how it's affecting the animals. But uh, this here's a photo of uh, of Point Bennett, and uh, you can see that's that's in June, which is, you know, during the during some of the peak predation time, and uh, there are lots of animals there. So uh, it's a pretty impressive place to to go see. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like nowhere else in the world, so it's, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Great information. Interesting research. Uh, now please help me welcome Ralph Collier. Ralph uh, S. Collier is founder and president of the Shark Research Committee, a 501c3 nonprofit scientific research corporation formed back in 1963. As a media consultant, he has appeared in more than two dozen Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and independent production documentaries about sharks and their behavior. Let's give a hand to Ralph. I'm Ralph Collier, president of the Shark Research Committee. And I've been invited here today by the city of Carpinteria. We're here to look at the interactions between white sharks and pinnipeds, which are seals and sea lions, white sharks and humans and the population dynamics of all of those groups. Uh, what we have looked at recently is this increase in the number of interactions between white sharks and, and these seals and sea lions, the pinnipeds. Uh, we also know that we've had an increase over the last 20 years in interactions between white sharks and humans, attacks on humans by sharks, uh, several of them fatal. And what we're trying to discern at the moment is, are the pinnipeds drawing more sharks to the area? Do we have an increase in the white shark population? Or is it simply a matter of having more people in the water than we've had prior decades? Uh, we know for a fact that in the 60s and 70s, the dynamics of the human population utilizing the ocean was much, much less than it is today. Uh, there are areas along the Southern California coast that back in the 60s and 70s, if you went to those locations, you would see very few people in the water. Those same locations today, there are hundreds of people in the water. When you add in the seals and sea lions with the humans, knowing that sharks prey on pinnipeds, you now have an interaction between three specific populations and those interactions from time to time can be fatal. Uh, what can be done about it? That's what we're gonna discuss. Uh, we want to see if there's something that we can't do in the way of an early warning system, <coughs> excuse me, using the attacks on pinnipeds as a key to the shark's presence. Uh, that point, we then disseminate this information so that the general public knows that we've recently had an interaction between a shark and a pinniped. We don't know if that shark has left. Uh, we don't know if it's still there. So sometimes caution is uh, the better move for the individual to make rather than going out. We also want to discuss and will discuss the physiology of white sharks. How they use their sensory systems to not only locate prey, but to determine whether something is of interest. Is it edible? Do I care about it? Uh, we're also going to discuss the fact that in the early spring, from Point Conception south down into Baja, this is the area that is utilized by females to give birth. They pup in this area. And there's a very specific reason for that. It has to do with water temperature and the available prey to the young sharks when they're born that we have in this area that we don't have from Point Conception North. That attracts uh, the females, the large females, close to shore. They give birth, and many years ago they would leave the area after giving birth. 
because they were out looking for seals and sea lions. Now, because of the increased population of seals and sea lions that has occurred over the last three to four decades, they don't necessarily have to leave the area anymore, which is a negative in that not only do they stay closer to shore, but the hormonal change that they go through when they give birth so that they don't turn around and eat their own young, they now remain in the area and that is a threat to the newborn shark, which means we're not sure exactly what's taking place with their population numbers. We don't know. Uh, all we can say for sure is that we've had an increase in these incidents. Whether that increase is tied to an oceanographic condition, uh, were there fewer bait fishes available? Uh, were the pinnipeds moving into this area uh, on an occasion? Uh, did their population increase sporadically because of oceanographic conditions? Were the sharks here because of oceanographic conditions? These are all things that we have to look at. This is not a simple answer. We cannot just make a snap decision, a knee-jerk reaction, and say, well, we have more sharks, or it's because of the pinnipeds. Uh, we have to take a look at all aspects of these, these population groups and determine, is it simply a matter of people doing something in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or is it simply the fact that we have more sharks moving up and down the coast in their usual migratory pattern? So these are things that we will discuss and hopefully at some point in time we'll be able to make a determination as to what uh, we can do to nullify these types of interactions. The reason juvenile white sharks are pupped or born in Southern California from Point Conception South into Baja is because when the shark is born, the size of its liver, which is where the shark stores its excess energy, is very small, is less than 10% of total body mass. In adult white sharks, liver mass is about 30% or more of total body mass. Meaning, as an example, a 4,200 pound white shark will have a liver that will weigh in excess of 1,400 pounds. The reason for that is that's where they store their excess energy. The energy is stored in the liver in the form of a buoyant oil called squalene. It is neutrally buoyant, so it not only does it allow the shark to save energy for the future when it needs it, but it also helps to reduce its weight in the water, so it doesn't take as much energy for it to swim through. The reason the juveniles are born here, their liver mass is very small, which means they have to start feeding right away, or they will metabolically burn up and die. Starting in March and going to September every two weeks, there's a grunion spawn. We find that these juvenile sharks congregate around those beaches where the grunion spawn, because not only do they have the opportunity of feeding on the grunion for four nights, which is the length of spawn for them, but they also can feed on the other fishes that are also attracted to the grunion. So they have kind of a buffet where they can pick and choose. This allows the young shark to consume a lot of nutrition, a lot of energy, most of which it can store in the liver. The, reason, the other reason they're born in Southern California is because of water temperature. From Point Conception North, it's a different water regime. The water is much colder than it is down here. We have tempered water. Sharks have to elevate their body temperature in order for them, their metabolism to function properly. If the shark is in warm water, or warmer than north of Point Conception, it doesn't have to generate as much energy to raise that body temperature. So this is where Mother Nature has told the sharks, you have to come to give birth. Now we bring the females in close to shore to give birth. We have surfers, we have swimmers, we have divers utilizing these same areas. So it's important for us to know the locations that the sharks are using to give birth, and we know the time of year. Uh, I discovered that years ago in the mid-70s, talking to commercial fishermen based on personal observation. We know that they were being born at that time, but what we don't know today is what locations are they using? 
Once we find out those locations, we can now disseminate that information to the surfers, the swimmers, the divers, and say, this is an area that possibly you should avoid during this period of time. And here's the reason why. <laughs> if you would like additional information, uh, you can go to the Shark Research Committee website, which is www.sharkresearchcommittee.com. Uh, you can also look for articles in the Santa Barbara News Press written by Peter Howorth. Peter will frequently put up information about these types of events and what we just recently have learned and he will disseminate information to the general public as to what's taking place with the seals, with the sharks, and with specific locations. I'm Peter Howorth, the director of Santa Barbara Marine Mammal Center. City of Carpinteria invited me here to discuss the situation with sharks and seals and also attacks on human which has been escalating over the past several years in the area. Particular concern of course is the Carpentria seal rookery which is very special to some people in Carpentria and not so popular with others. We're here to provide information about why we feel the attacks have increased, whether the seals are responsible or not for this increase in attacks or whether there are other factors involved. To do this we have Jeff Harris from NOAA Fisheries National Marine Mammal Lab who has been researching shark attacks out of the Channel Islands which are showing a parallel increase. He's working on shark attacks on sea lions out at San Miguel Island but is also familiar with the situation in Carpinteria. Another thing that's been mentioned is moving these seals out of here to reduce the hazard, some of the people have discussed that. Bill Struble is with NOAA Fisheries as an enforcement agent. He's going to explain the law and a bit about what uh, goes on with moving seals. It's, uh, it's a very complicated legal issue, not that simple. Ralph Collier is here to talk about sharks and shark attack. He'll be talking about diversity, evolution, natural history, and attacks in particular I'll be talking about the attacks in this region. Why I'm here as a representative of Santa Barbara Marine Mammal Center is that we feel that the seals and sea lions are canaries in the coal mine. If you get an increase of attacks on seals and sea lions, the risk for humans can escalate correspondingly. So we feel that we can provide a public service in letting the authorities know if there have been recent attacks or sightings of uh, sharks in the area. That way people can receive some information, timely information. They can make an informed decision whether they want to go out in the water or not. They might want to choose a different area. Have had attacks right in this area, uh, sometimes multiple attacks on seals. And if I were surfing at the time, right out in front of the seal rookery, for example, when seals were being mauled by sharks, I would appreciate knowing about it. Some people feel, feel differently, but that's their decision. Uh, we're just trying to promote public safety and help with the, help the officials uh, in giving them a heads up when this sort of threat exists. And we're not trying to cry wolf. We're wanting to make sure the threats are credible. We don't want a situation where anything that has a fin is a, automatically a great white shark because it just isn't true. As the people here know, we've got a lot of dolphins sea lions, everything else out there with fins. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to cry wolf. Uh, there's problems with people seeing, for example, a coastal bottlenose dolphin, they see the fin and they automatically think it's a shark. So we want to make sure that if somebody reports seeing a large shark, we want to make sure that indeed is really what happens. It also depends on the location of the shark. If it's four miles offshore, it's probably not too much of a hazard let's say at Carpinteria Beach State Park. If it's uh, right in the park itself and there's a, a freshly killed seal uh, floating along, that's a whole different story. We want uh, people to know about that. And different user groups, ocean user groups, have different uh, protocols. For example, divers would be concerned about sightings of, of great whites out in the kelp beds or attacks on pinnipeds out in the kelp beds. By pinnipeds, I mean seals and sea lions. Um, swimmers would be concerned about sharks right in the surf zone. And white sharks do go all the way 
in, into the surf zone on occasion. Sometimes they even beach themselves. They've been known to snatch seals off of rocks and off of sandbars, literally coming out of the water to do so. So assuming that you're in shallow water, you're safe, is a dead wrong assumption. Also, we'll be talking a little bit about areas where there are repeated attacks, both on humans and on, on seals. Uh, certainly, there have been repeated attacks on seals at the Carpentry or Rookery. As far as areas in Santa Barbara where repeated attacks have occurred on humans, Surf Beach has had four attacks, two of which were fatal. That is very definitely an area to be very, very wary of. Castle Rock out at San Miguel Island, I believe there have been four or five attacks out there on humans. That's quite a ways from Carpinteria, and yet a lot of the people here enjoy the water as divers, servers, etc. So it's useful to know where these attacks are occurring. Seasonality seems to be summer, early fall, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything because that could change with the changing situation. The fact remains, uh, in the 1990s, there were four attacks on people from San Simeon to the Mexican border. In the 2000s, there have been 31 attacks. It's a dramatic increase on attacks on humans. So we're concerned about it. We want to do what we can to let people know if there is a hazard out there so the cities and county government, et cetera, can post signs, get out the warning to folks. And if they decide they still want to take the risk, that's their choice. We're not trying to scare everybody out of the water, but just give them a heads up. It's much like a sign at the base of San Marcos Pass that says, ice ahead. You might want to go to Gaviota Pass to avoid an icy road. Same thing if you know that an attack has just occurred by a great white shark in the area you want to go swimming, that would be nice to know as well. So that's what we're trying to do this evening. We're going to invite all of our speakers back up to uh, sit at the table as a panel. And I appreciate everyone who took the time to write questions. And we'll spend the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes running through the questions. Thank you. All right, I've uh, looked through the questions quickly. I hope we can get through them. We have a number of them, and, and not surprisingly, uh, many of them have to do with, uh, with personal safety. What do we know about great white vision? People have reported great white spy hopping, that's in quotes. Are they able to see us like we see them? Um, white sharks spy hop. It's a habit they have where when they want to see something above the surface, they'll stick their head out. Now, other species of sharks also do that. The oceanic white tip does it. Uh, that's been observed. Uh, we think the reason the oceanic white tip does it is because air currents carry the smell of decaying animals in the ocean further and faster than ocean currents. And we think because there's not a lot of food out in the middle of the ocean where oceanic white tips live, the reason they stick their head above the water is to actually smell the air to see if there's anything in the area. White sharks do it for a different reason. They want to see what's going on above the surface of the water, and they want to see it a little more clearly. Years ago, a commercial salmon fisherman that uh, set gill nets at the Farallon Islands, this is back in the early 60s, told me a story about setting his nets late in the afternoon, anchoring the boat and getting ready to go to bed. And he looked up and saw this large dorsal fin cruising right off the island in front of this haul-out area where there were a number of pinnipeds. And this shark would move through the water a little ways, and then the fin would disappear, and his head would stick up. And the head would drop, and he would go a little bit further, and he would stick his head up. And he went back and forth in this area for about 20 minutes doing this. Finally, it disappeared. About five or 10 minutes later, all of a sudden, he said this 17, 18-foot white shark came flying up out of the water right next to the shore, came crashing down, and guess what all the seals did? They jumped in the water. Next thing he saw was a big upwelling of red, which meant the shark had obtained its meal. Now that shark made a cognitive decision. It ran along the beach, looked at the animals on the shore, and decided where it would have the best opportunity to get a meal if it breached. 
We've since learned, since that time, over the decades, that these animals are very intelligent, they learn quickly, and spy hopping is just one of their behaviors that helps them locate their prey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ralph. Any other uh, comments from panelists on that? Any experiences? Jeff? Okay. Uh, here's a question. I swim in the ocean year-round. What color swimsuit is best to wear to avoid being mistaken for a seal? Not yum-yum yellow. Um, we know, as I said earlier, white sharks can see color. To what extent, we don't know. Contrasting bright colors in a bathing suit are not a good idea. Several years ago, there was a lady that would swim at Sunset Beach. I showed you the photograph earlier. And she was out there, and she loved to wear jewelry. And she had a very large silver ring on her left hand, on her ring finger. And she was swimming along, and suddenly something grabbed her left hand and pulled the ring off. Well, it just happened to be during a grunion spawn. She just happened to be swimming through that school of grunion, and it turned out that the shark had pulled this silver ring off of her hand because all it saw was flashes in the water, which is what sharks see when bait fish are reacting and moving through the water quickly. So the shark didn't bite her because it wanted to eat her. It bit the ring because it thought it was potential food. So it's not a good idea to wear jewelry in the water. It's not a good idea to wear bright contrasting colors, especially in areas where white sharks are known to, to be uh, moving uh, because it can attract their attention. Only from the standpoint that they're going to look at you and say, what the devil is that? I've never seen that before. And they'll come over to take a look. So avoid wearing those types of things, jewelry, bright colors. I'd, I'd add a little anecdote about this lifeguard who was attacked by a, what he thought was a sea lion up at El Capitan Beach. And the, the very next day, we picked up this large fur seal, which later died. Um, unfortunately, we took the fur seal to the museum so they'd have the specimen and brought the lifeguard in and actually compared the bite wounds on his arm with the mouth of the fur seal and concluded that that's probably was, was the animal that bit him because of the nature of the attack. The animal bit him and held on and shook and held on, sea lions don't bite like that. At any rate, I uh, talked to the chief lifeguard and I said, we're thinking about a cartoon. If we can get a photo of your lifeguard that got bitten, I want to have the caption saying, is that a mackerel in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Here's our next question from Karen. Will it ever be possible to include a camera to video as well as track the sharks? And if so, how soon do you see this happening? Uh, they've already done that. Uh, they put what they call a critter cam on the back of the shark. Uh, the first thing they tried to do was simply attach it with a tether to a piece of stainless steel wire and let this thing that looked like a odd shaped torpedo with fins on the back of it, move through the water with the shark. The only problem with that is you got dizzy looking at the video footage because the camera kept spinning back and forth and you could never tell if you were right side up or upside down. So then they decided that they were gonna mount it in the back of the shark next to the dorsal fin and that would help. Well, the problem they had then is not realizing that the shark actually from the dorsal fin down to the snout, the shark slopes downward they put the camera this way and pointed the lens out there, and you couldn't see anything the shark was doing. So they worked on it since, and although it has worked a couple of times, the amount of information you get really isn't that pertinent because you can't make out what's taking place. It happens so fast uh, when a shark is feeding, whether it be on fish or marine mammals. Uh, so they've kind of given up on that. Uh, what we're looking at now are new tags, uh, pat tags, that you stick in the animal, and over time, six to nine months, the uh, wire is corroded by the salt water, the tag pops off, floats to the surface, it has a little antenna, it transmits to the Argo satellite, downloads all of its data. These new tags now have a 
solar cell on the side so that they can recharge and last a little longer. And they also have an accelerometer which tells us when the shark speeds up and it shows us what area the shark's in. When it does that, it gives us some idea whether or not it's possibly feeding. But video cameras, they've tried that and it just, it didn't work well. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, is this work being done by the Shark Research Institute? Is it uh, also being done by NOAA? Uh, most of this work actually has been done by uh, producers doing documentaries for Discovery Channel. And it's been done in South Africa and a couple of times in Australia. Um, yeah, it's difficult to get that type of funding uh, for grants for that type of thing. The, the um, foundations and the, uh, the other organizations really aren't interested in the videotape you get. They're more interested in hard factual data. And once it was discovered that you can't really determine that much from this type of a of a, a usage of a video camera, they they just they've fallen away from it. They uh, some of the researchers as well I know knows uh, not really a camera that's fashioned to the shark, but they use what they call a pole cam. They lower the pole into the water when the animal's feeding, and they have actually have seen some pretty darn good video of sharks feeding in that manner without endangering the uh, humans involved, the researchers. Maybe Jeff or Bill can uh, answer this. Where, where does NOAA get its information about the health of the uh, fisheries? Num numbers uh, of animals and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, well, if you're if you're um, are you talking about um, with sea lions and and uh, marine mammals? Yes. Um, yeah, that's um, well with the Marine Mammal Lab. Um, we do we do all of our. Um, I mean, we we actually count the uh, the pups born um, each year out at San Miguel and uh, and other rookeries as well. But um, that's all that's all done by uh, by no biologists. Great, thank you. Hey, uh, here, here's a question from Susan: How do great whites navigate in totally dark conditions? Very carefully. <laughs> no, uh, it has to do in their inner ear they have minerals. The minerals interact with the Earth's gravitational pull and they use it kind of like a compass. And it's almost the same, similar to a GPS, where they can navigate, hammerhead sharks do it in the middle of the ocean. They can go from coastal areas along South America and North America out to these seamounts uh, where they breed and also where they um, have cleaning stations and they will navigate at night. Uh, sharks, unlike us, do not lay down at night and take a nice nap. Uh, most of them are swimming constantly, and they use uh, not only their lateral line, which detects pressure vibrations, water movement along the side of the body, uh, but they also use uh, these, the inner ear to help navigate in certain directions. Now, what's interesting, many years ago, a pilot was observing a large white shark that was moving from just outside Long Beach Harbor towards Catalina and it was on a heading and he followed this shark for about oh an hour and it stayed right on that heading and suddenly he noticed on the surface about a couple of hundred yards in front of this shark a large mola mola sunfish as the shark approached the mola when it detected it it suddenly veered off his course went over and just bit the dickens out of this mola several times turned around came back over and got right back on that same heading, headed towards Catalina. Now the odds that it would pick up the identical heading is very slim. So it's doing this from a physiological standpoint, and it's doing it because of the, the uh, inner ear, the uh, formation of it and these minerals that are found in the inner ear. Here's another uh, shark behavior question. Statistically speaking, how much more likely are you to be attacked by a great white shark than a normal slash average individual if you are a surfer? And a second follow-up question, what are the top three reasons great whites attack humans and how can a surfer avoid them? Stay out of the water. <laughs> um, about in the 2000s, about 48% of the victims, of the 72 victims that have been attacked from 2000 to 2012, 
48% are surfers. Um, the, and the reason for that, in my opinion, is that unlike divers, uh, kayakers kind of fall into the same category as surfers, and we're starting to see more interactions with kayaks now. A diver goes out and is in the water for a few hours if you're not a commercial diver, if you're a sport diver. You're out there for several hours and then you leave. Surfer goes out first thing in the morning and if he's off work that day, he'll be out there until the sun sets and some of them stay after that. So when you're on the water that long, you increase your probability of an interaction with the shark if there's one in the area simply because of the fact you're making yourself available to the animal. Uh, kayakers from 1900 to the present, we've had 13 attacks on kayaks. Eight have occurred since the year 2000. Um, most of the attacks from 1900 to the present have occurred in a three month period, August, September, and October. Um, so depending upon the amount of time, and as Peter pointed out earlier, and it's not what you're doing, it's where you're doing it, and how long you're on the water that makes you a potential victim for one of these events. Now, there are three types of attacks by white sharks. Uh, one would be a provoked attack, where the individual does something provocative to the shark, pokes it, jabs it, pulls on the tail, does something like that, and that causes the shark to strike out at them. Uh, the other type of attack is investigation, where the shark isn't quite sure what the object is, and it will check it out it'll circle it, it'll smell the water, it'll do all these things, it looks it over, and finally, as a last resort, it takes a gentle bite. And believe me, they're gentle. The last one is a full-blown predatory attack, which, as I said earlier, are high-energy, high-velocity events that are meant to kill or immobilize the prey on contact, and those generally are pretty horrific to the individual. I'd like to just add one thing, and that is uh, we're, we're seeing the emerging situation with increased shark attacks, but we're also seeing an emerging situation in the sense of stand-up paddle boarding. You hardly saw any of them in the 1990s, so of course there weren't any attacks then, or maybe very few, and now we're seeing more. And with the increase in popularity of that sport, we've seen a similar parallel, I think, in kayaking, uh, where when it started become popu becoming popular, surfing was first of the uh, of those sports to start becoming popular, and so we see more attacks on surfers. But as these other watercraft become popular, you start seeing increased attacks on them. So making assumptions at this point as things are developing uh, should be probably with caution. And, and Ralph, you might want to elaborate on that, but I just wanted to point out that as these new sports come in, uh, they come with a unperceived hazards, and we need to watch those. Uh, Betty has a question based on some information on the East Coast. The sharks were also more frequently uh, off Cape Cod this summer, and scientists are th uh, tracking their movements this winter. It seems most spend their winter in Florida. What do you know about our great whites, do they commute somewhere? Yes, uh, the white sharks that inhabit the Pacific coast have a definite migratory pattern uh, in that they <clears throat> will move north, of course, and south. Uh, you find that in the early spring, March and April, February, um, you will have large sharks close inshore uh, in Southern California. Those generally are female sharks. As the year progresses, those sharks steadily move north. Uh, they will then move out to the islands. Some of those sharks, not all, some will move out to the mid-Pacific uh, around the Hawaiian Islands, and then they'll come back. They'll move down into Baja. So they have a, a definite area in which they move. Uh, some sharks, some of these sharks, have a two-year cycle. And it was suggested by several people that Possibly the same shark was responsible for both fatal attacks at Surf Beach. One occurred, actually we had an attack there in 2008. Uh, the individual was very lucky, it just bit the surfboard, didn't bite him. 2010 we had a fatal attack, as Peter pointed out, um, on Lucas Ransom. And then 2012, 
uh, just this past year, um, Francisco was fatally attacked up there. And some people say, well, possibly it's the same shark. Well, that's highly unlikely unless it shrank in size because the shark that bit Lucas Ransom and killed him was about 16 to 17 feet, and then the shark that struck uh, Francisco was somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 15. So unless it shrank in size over that two-year period, they were two different sharks, but what it does point out, as Peter mentioned, is that you have a specific location that's being utilized by these animals because we have two fatal attacks in a two-year period, three attacks in general over six years, all of them in the same location, and by different sized animals. So that means you don't have one animal using that area, you have a group of animals that are moving through that area. So as he pointed out, it's a good idea to check some statistics, look into where you want to have your ocean fun, and go have fun, by all means. Last year, uh, there were only 88 people worldwide that were attacked by sharks. Uh, in addition to being president of the Shark Research Committee, I'm also director of the Global Shark Attack File. And we had only 88 people. Now, you stop and think about this. How many millions of people were in the ocean this past year? How many contact hours did we have? And to only have 88 attacks, of which nine were fatal, about 10%, um, that's a ridiculous figure. Two years ago, we had six surfers die in California while engaged in their sport, broken necks, drownings, etc. We haven't had six attacks by white sharks in any given year ever along the Pacific coast. So it's, it is a very rare event that occurs. It's very tragic when it occurs. But a lot of times if you look into what's taking place and you really do some research, you can find that there are reasons and there are good times of the year and bad times of the year. But as Peter pointed out, anytime you go in the ocean, just like going to the mountains, you can have a run-in with a potential predator. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, here's a question about blue sharks. Uh, the writer's recollection is that in the 50s, uh, blue sharks were much more common in Southern California and maybe the Channel Islands, if I can read this. Uh, what's their situation now? Blue sharks have been decimated through finning. Uh, in 1968, Shelley Applegate and I went to Catalina Island and we set a long line, 200 hooks. Shelley was doing uh, some research on what he called shark hard parts, the cartilage in the shark system. We set this 200 hook long line set, it took us about four hours because we're not very good at it. And when we got to the end of it, the skipper, Boots, looked at us and said, guys, we're gonna have to pick this up or you're gonna lose it because we've got a weather front coming in. We looked off in the distance, the wind had picked up, so we went back to the beginning. It had only been in the water four hours. We caught 196 sharks and had four empty hooks. They went to the same place in 1996, LA County Museum, Jeff Siegel and Cam Swift. They put out the same long line set. Ours was in the water four hours. They left theirs 24 hours. They caught six sharks and had 194 hooks with bait still on it. That tells you what happened in about 30 years to the blue shark population, because except for 20 sharks, all of the ones we caught were blue sharks. Thanks, Ralph. Any other uh, responses, follow-up? Uh, here's, here's another uh, question about shark behavior, um, and I'll try to summarize here. Um, uh, the question is, do, do mature or older white sharks uh, tend to retire to a particular site, in particular a rookery, in their older years? And if so, could that happen in our area? No, we, we don't have any data to support that at all. Um, old researchers do that. We find a <laughs> place we like, but not, no, not sharks. No. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, we're getting close to the final questions here. I, I swim parallel to the shore past the surf break. How far out, or maybe the question is, is there a safe distance uh, from the shore to be safe from sharks? Hey. Jim Stewart is the chief diving officer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and he was asked what to do when you see a, a shark and a white shark in the water, and he said, swim to shore as quickly as you can, run, don't walk, to your car, jump in, roll up the windows, 
lock the doors, turn up the radio as loud as you can, and get the hell out of there. <laughs> Any place is dangerous. They can actually, they've actually been known to snatch seals off of sandbars and off of rocks. So being in knee-deep water isn't necessarily going to be safe. Just to comment quickly on what Peter just said, <clears throat> many years ago, back in the 70s, I worked with a gentleman, Ron Warner, who was a fish and game biologist in Eureka, and he called me up one day and he said, I've got a great story for you. He said a guy was fly fishing in the little river, which is this neat little river up there that salmon utilize in steelhead. And he was about a quarter of a mile from the ocean, and there was a little sandbar, and this seal had gone up the river and was lying on this sandbar. This man was fly fishing, I believe it was steelhead that, were, that was running at the time. Anyway, uh, he heard this noise and looked over and saw this white shark about 12, 13 feet long had slid up onto the sandbar, grabbed the seal, cut it in half, and was floundering and flipping to get back in the water. And the seal, the upper part of the body, rolled to the other side of this little sandbar and the shark swam around and slid up on the sandbar and took the rest of the seal. Now this is a quarter of a mile from the ocean. He said the fly fisherman just stood there with his mouth hanging open. And when he interviewed him a week later, the guy told him he was now doing nothing but lake fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that little event. So um, yeah, sharks will take them off of rocks. They'll take them, uh, they'll come up just as, as sometimes dolphin will do. All right, our final question has to do with uh, something called a, a serial shark theory, Ralph. Is this something you've heard of? Um, yeah, I think what they're talking about is a rogue shark. Uh, and that's, that's been around. That was first proposed by uh, V.M. Coppelson, who was a physician in Australia. In the 1930s, he started looking at shark attacks. And because he saw attacks occurring in the same location over and over and over, he thought it was the same shark. Uh, we know today that that's not true. What you have is uh, some research that I did on these recurring locations that Peter spoke of, where you have sharks moving through those areas, and if you go to those areas, there's a greater chance that you're gonna have an interaction with a shark. And that's what Coppelson was looking at. They thought a few years ago, I was called to Egypt, uh, when they had a series of five attacks in six days, one of them fatal at a place called Sharm el Sheikh in the tip of the southern Sinai. And they said that there was one shark and it was doing all of this and it was a rogue shark and we had proof. Well, as it turned out, to make a long story short, divers had been feeding this oceanic white tip for more than a year. So this uh, shark got used to being fed by hand. And the shark would come in and we actually saw video footage of it being done. Shark extended his left hand, and, I mean the diver and the shark came in and the diver let go of this fish, and the shark gobbled it up and swam behind him. As the shark swam behind the diver, he took his right hand and reached behind and pulled a fish out of a fanny pack to offer it to the shark again. That shark, after going through that for a year, decided one day to swim up to this woman and expected a fish. She put out her left hand. The oceanic white tip promptly bit it off. It swam behind her and raced in and tore out most of her buttocks. Why? Because it had seen and smelled the fish in the fanny pack and it expected it to be there. So this was not a rogue shark that was feeding on humans. This was a shark that had been fed by humans who had conditioned the animal and that's why it did what it did. There are no rogue sharks. We have not proven that scientifically and I don't think we ever will. Thank you. Once again, let's thank all our speakers. And once again, thank you all for coming. Again, this has been recorded tonight in large part, and along with interviews with some of our panelists, and we'll be replaying it on Government Access Television 21. Good evening.